thank you so much for being with us. So I'm Helen from Cadence, um, look after our people and partnerships here. I'd love to um, hear a bit about you and your journey to where you are today in your consultancy. Amazing. Thank you, Helen. And by the way, it's so nice to be here as well. Thank you for the invite. Um, yeah, so I run a corporate wellbeing consultancy and we specialise in environments, experiences and culture um, all around making work better. That's basically as simple as it is. Um, background being um, spent majority of my life in workplace. Um, love obviously every part of workplace that there is, but are conscious that it's completely evolved <laughs> over the last five years, uh, really completely evolved. And we need to change of course with that and that's hopefully what my consultancy does one of the things we were chatting about before was this um bridging or attempts to bridge this gap between workplace real estate um, um facilities teams and people and hr and how with hybrid there there hasn't been because this is also new um, an obvious function that owns hybrid working it's kind of falling between these two operations um, and you know other people within an organization that sort of feel like they make sense to own it but perhaps don't have the skill set to um, so can you share any any um, of your experience on that just this this gap that seems to exist yeah unfortunately the gap exists because people aren't thinking about their roles and what their role actually rolls up into. So if I take a step back and think about if you were to speak to just a normal facilities person and say, you know, what's your role? They'd say it's to maintain the building. I've got to do all of the checks and balances on the building, etc. If you speak to HR, it'd be, you know, compliance around HR policies, procedures, etc nobody actually is blending across that whatsoever everybody's operating in silos within big organizations and I genuinely think people are forgetting that the people that work for them are the most important um, asset it's horrible to think of people as an asset but literally they are they're the most important asset and the big gap that exists is because organizations are not actually asking their people what they want and I don't understand why that is because sometimes when we are setting up buildings or we're setting up organizations our level might be up here of what we think the expectation is and our colleagues or our employees level might be here and actually we're going in too high and if we just spoke to them we could meet in the middle <laughs> do you know what I mean so for me I think that gap exists because people are not sure where ownership ends where it starts and you always sort of get told in corporates you need to stay in your lane I don't believe that's right and actually if you're always staying in your lane you're missing that sweet spot in the middle absolutely so how do you go about helping organizations um, understand what the office means for them and their people but if you stop and speak with like the c-suite and any executive leadership team everybody everybody thinks something different and also I genuinely think they're too busy to come up with what the office is about I, and, and it's not a priority it's not a strategic priority for them they're relying on a real estate team and I think sometimes the real estate team unfortunately are thinking about their job their roles like pushing something pushing people to something because they think that potentially they won't have a job if we don't continue to have an office and I genuinely think we're we're kind of meeting it from the wrong perspective. Like I said, our people should be at the center of that. And if the office isn't what the people want, then why have we got it? Whether that means you're going to have a job or not, I think you should still be acting in the interest of the people. Um, and yeah, and I think that's where the challenge comes. And when you actually sit with leadership team and say, look, what would you like the office to be? It's really hard for them to actually even think about that. Um, some of the retail organizations that I work with, it's kind of easier because they're used to having this kind of physical footprint for consumers to come in and purchase stuff. And they know what that means and they can translate that back to an office. What could the head office look like? What could it feel like? What could it what could what could be the North Star of that space? But genuinely, uh, most of the organizations that I speak to, they're not even sure. It's almost like they're committed to the real estate because of a lease. And that's not enough. You know what I mean? To, that's not good enough reason to have an office. No. And like you say, I mean, it makes total sense that if somebody has been like KPI'd on that lease and sweating the asset, as you said, then of course they're going to push that agenda. Of course they are. Um, and so it also makes total sense to me that the leadership team would have very different perspectives on what the office mean because everybody's got their own personal situations and and like realities of how 
and where, when they want to work. Again, so many companies have just said, go back to the office, but they've made no changes to what that real estate footprint looks like any of the features within it so it's now not even working for the basics that we used to be able to go into the office for you know so the technology is not up to scratch you don't have two screens to be able to have a hybrid conversation like there's so many things that you know there's no quiet spaces in the office which when you've worked from home you've had your ideal setup so now when you're being told not only have you got to go in so your empowerment's gone but also the space isn't fit for purpose it doesn't help you to do your job that's where I think the problem comes um that it should have been like let's have, let's all have a conversation around what we'd like to do and get people's sentiment on that and then make a decision around actually what the space should be like and then let's think about what we want to do in the space before we even build out what it looks like and really like stop before we start this um I don't know how to put it, this kind of like rampage to get back. It feels like that's the, that's the end result, but actually it's not because once you get people back, you've got that issue of people not being happy in the space, lacking autonomy, and also just not having a space that actually helps them do their work. Yeah, often organisations are going for this sort of return to work mandate, which is just blanket, everybody's got to do the same thing. Can you talk a little bit to that? Having an agreement of like a one day in the office or whatever it might be, where you're all going to come together a minimum of like, this is what you've got to do, I think is absolutely fine. And I think everyone can get behind that. Um, The challenge comes is when an organization says you have to be in the office three times a week. Um, But actually, maybe it's a global team who are working with people from India or all over. Um, And the experience is worse because when they get in the office, there's background noise, which they didn't have at home. They haven't got the screen set up like they have at home if they're coding or doing whatever. Um, So that's where I think this kind of flexibility within a bigger policy really helps, where maybe it's a team that are all working globally. They've got no one in the office that's an immediate part of their team. Why would they not have a different agreement? Because it doesn't make any sense. They're going to commute for an hour to come into an office to sit by themselves to connect in with people that they would do at home they've wasted two hours of their day so that's where I think it's really important for an organization to be aware and to sit with colleagues to actually understand like what do you do in a day what does it look like what what are your regular activities that you're doing and then make a decision who who has that conversation in the organization you know who kind of hosts that conversation and gets the feedback and shares the learnings I, I just think it's so new um that it can be really hard to figure out who is responsible for all of this. I think the problem comes is that leaders' roles have become so hectic, so busy, so many meetings, so much like in this hamster wheel that they've forgotten the whole reason they're a leader is to lead and empower and support their people. And that's where I think sometimes things go awry. And sometimes leaders will just agree with whoever they're yeah CEO is or or whatever don't want to put their head above the parapet and say actually this isn't working rolling the technology out and not doing the change management in the background for you know to understand why am I using this technology now what are the benefits how is it going to work how is my life going to be easier by using this technology I think that also sometimes is a problem so again senior leaders go oh it's just a tool they just need to use the tool like I'm not going to invest in the change management part of it but to shift behaviors and to shift mindset takes so much work I mean it literally does it's like pushing water up a hill sometimes and you know you need everybody to understand what is going to be the benefit and half of these tools only work really well if everybody's using them that's the challenge isn't it um so and and that visibility to see where your colleagues are and to sort of go okay I've got x task to do I need this person from HR oh she's in and x is in from finance let's say I'm going to come to the office that's going to be such a meaningful experience then because you've had that conversation face to face there's not this zooming out and bigger picture being looked at the, the, the people that we're talking about are kind of often focused on their own the way they're targeted their own role what is important to them I just think why would we go back like this is just like the whole momentum of COVID pushed I had a few when I was at Nike I had a future workplace strategy and it was like going to be live in 2025 that's what I was planning 2020 it happened you know like all the plans for the five years down the line happened in like four months and it was incredible and it was like wow we're moving in such a positive direction people can pick their kids up be at the school gates like do all of these amazing things and suddenly we're pushing back to an old way of working on what basis I don't see any evidence to support pushing back to the old ways of working and getting people in and 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 everything like that and if I had children like I said I don't 
I would want my kids to have this choice, empowerment, like flexibility to work, how they want to work, where they want to work from, um, and give them that inspiration and motivation to want to work. Like when you actually put it on paper and go, right, you're going to have to be in the office four days a week, five days a week. When I think back to how we used to work, why did we do it? I just, you know what I mean? It was just, you're in this cycle. And I genuinely think for a lot of people, it's easier to go back than to sit in the discomfort of this chaos. But you do work with organizations that are more innovative than that and they get it um, and they're making the change, even though it's hard. Can you give us some examples of where you've seen things go well? The organizations where things go really well uh, takes two things. One is actually listening to colleagues doing a whole process around surveys focus groups what do you want to see for your future ways of working you know how would you like to work taking all of that information in you know putting it into a document to present back to leadership leadership being open to what this new world could look like taking away which is really hard all of that kind of how I want to work situation and like what my preference would be taking all of that aside and listening to their people and then coming to a blend in the middle where leadership might be getting what they want but also colleagues are getting what they want and I think the organizations I've worked with where they've done that I mean the the results have been phenomenal to a point where one particular company I worked with leadership at the very start were like we just we've got no culture anymore that was their thought when they went into it it was like we don't have any culture anymore because we're not in the office and then when we spoke with colleagues the COVID pandemic had been a moment in time where they felt trusted empowered and loved working for the company more than what they had prior and listening to them talk about that and we recorded some of the conversations obviously took a non anonymity out of it um but we basically um presented all that back and obviously me being independent right I can do that because I don't have any bias either way I just want what's best for the business and the people um so I could share all of that back and the leadership to take it to sort of listen maybe not agree but sort of mumble on it a little bit and then come back and say actually we're going to create a flexible working policy off the back of it and the results have been phenomenal that particular organization they'd done surveys prior and surveys after and there's uh, one section of the survey is just uh, like what's your word what's your like what like everyone consolidates a word back they just randomly pick out a word and prior to us going in it was uncertainty was like the word that everybody was feeling they didn't Mm. know what was going to happen there's uncertainty nervousness these were the kind of words that were coming up and when we did the survey again after I've obviously moved off this is six months later down the line they did the survey again and the number one words coming out were trust trusted and empowered um, which for me is phenomenal because you'd taken an all through the focus groups you could see as well people were very anxious worried about what was the future was going to be and then obviously later down the line just six months down the line there was all this feeling of like we are trusted and we can carry on doing what we're doing and they've listened to us it was like a really positive exercise like legitimately if we were to really focus on the people all the time so your first factor is is this better or worse for the people in the organization and if we think we can't categorically say it's positive then why are we doing it that that for me is is the lens that people should be making decisions in the business on um because you know what it's like when you've got customers people are always like oh, we need, we need to prioritize a customer. I, I do think we need to prioritize a customer, but the person who should be prioritized is the people that work for you. And they're your number one customer. Do you know what I mean? Really? Um, and I think, unfortunately, sometimes companies forget that. So helpful, Bex. Such, such important wisdom here. Hope you can keep doing what you're doing and keep shouting loudly. 